I'm just going to give a little bit of information about the Connecticut Poetry Circuit itself, which is the sponsor of this really wonderful collegiate program. Um, the Connecticut Poetry Circuit was established in 1968 to continue the work of the New England Poetry Circuit, which was established in 1964 at the request of the American, uh, the Academy of American Poets. Um, the work of the circuit is guided by a panel of poets. Uh, this year, for this for this year, it was Randall Horton, Vivian Shipley, Claire Rossini, Kate Russian, and John Stanisi. Each year, the panel judges a statewide competition of college student poets, selecting four or five exemplary student poets who then tour the state in the spring. Um, the Connecticut Poetry Circuit is not funded. Uh, all the work of the panel and the people who, uh, the director and the people who serve, it's done gratis to, to further the um, opportunities for these collegiate, collegiate poets. Um, as the late poet Dick Allen, who faithfully served on and promoted the circuit for many years, um, said in his final email about his judging results, he wrote, hugely valuable competition for uh, Connecticut College student poets, and it is. Um, so today, the circuit is directed by Professor James Gentile of the um, Manchester Community College. So thank you, James. Thank you, panel of poets, uh, for all the work you did uh, in bringing us this evening's poets. So let's get going. And now, I don't know. I know I had been um, told that the, the poets sometimes introduce each other. Are you prepared to do that? Who would like to go first? <laughs> um, we usually go by uh, we usually go by last name first, so Isabel's usually first. But I guess I will go first, um, and I guess I'll introduce myself, which is oh. I'm Oliver. I'm a uh, I'm a senior at Wesleyan University, and um, I'm majoring in English. And um, I founded this thing called the Route Nine Literary Collective, which is an organization at Wesleyan and Middlesex County supporting um, literature and various events there. And we put together a book called the Route Nine Anthology, which is a collection of writing from Wesleyan students, faculty, staff, and Middlesex County residents. Um, and that came out from Wesleyan University Press in the fall. So if you are interested in reading some work of Central Connecticut, you can, you can go buy that book. Maybe it's even at the library, who knows? Or you could get it at the library. Um, so I'll just gonna hop right in and just read some poems, I guess. And um, so these are poems. I'm gonna read four poems, um, which are all um, kind of in conversation with this place called the Walter Fernald Developmental Center, which was a center in Massachusetts for disabled uh, children. Um, my great great grandfather was Walter Fernald, who was the third superintendent of the school. So I use um, kind of archival materials throughout and you will see that in the titles. And I'm also writing a little bit about my older brother who has a brain illness and um, kind of responding with it. And that, that's what this first poem is about um, my older brother. Um, and it's called First Night and What Follows. Hold each palm of your person and count the lines that lead to your story. There was the first night, the fingers pulling on eyelids, the terror of a black crowned murderer sharpening knives in the yard. My father fear on the phone to my mother, whole family laying together on the hardwood in the TV room. My older brother curling his form into a flame, sight left longer in place, the person gone, the person gone. Then sirens, were there sirens or just the red taillights of my father's truck pulling from the driveway. As my brother began to bear that buried raven that rose from child's blood, landed on his shoulder, and for no reason feasted on every line he held in his hands. Then what but needles, bags of red, blue, liquid, muted days, pushing the cold metal of the swing, battling nerf swords, old imagination under many falls, last leaves, cries of panic as he wakes up two days after his release, pulling at his collar, his tearing of sheets, my parents, what are you doing? What are you doing? My dad leaning over the sink, splashing water on his face a day or years later. I must have drowned a child in a past life to deserve this. My small palm on his back pressing or together down a trail, that full family, my hand 
or my brothers extended outward by the taut leash of a dog smelling blood. Thanks. <laughs> um, and um, this is a... Uh, this is now one of the Fernald poems. Um, this is the 24th annual report of the trustees of the Massachusetts School of Idiotic and Feeble-Minded Youth, October, 1871. And they each have an epigraph. So this is the epigraph. The daily morning prayer, the blessings at meals, the evening supplication are not made in vain. A little boy who lately died became during his sickness, an object of great interest to the matron, teachers and attendants who all became by turn his tender nurses. The approach of death seemed to awaken the spiritual life. This is the poem. It is not made in vain, the ritual, the morning daily prayer, the blessings at meals, the little ones at night, knees bent by their beds, clasped palms up and out to him of whom they know nothing. Doubtless there was joy in heaven when George Toby, the little idiot, died. He put up those hands and muttered, me want to go up, me want to go up as feathers spread like ash among the thousand hands of nurses who wept and prayed and pet the black jet of his hair off the heat of his head. Do my tears take his eyes? Did he just want to be one boy of many, another gravestone upheaved for the driveway of a new four bedroom? Do I not always refuse his permission? The room was filled with onlookers who stared and sweared that out of that decaying body seemed to rise the growing soul, some feathered thing, some untethered tide as he sighed to some sort of heaven. They'll say, here comes one of the boys from the South Boston yeah. School for Feeble-Minded. It is not made in vain. Every night as the little ones kneel by their sheets, they hear something higher and better than men, the wings which rustle in a herd bound for nothing, a heaven without tears, where each stone is sunk without. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, I have two left. This is another one of the fertile poems. This is the 57th annual report of the trustees of the Massachusetts School of the Feeble-Minded at Waltham for the year ending September 30th, 1904. I haven't read this one, uh, other Connecticut poets, so get excited, this is new. Um, <laughs> and this is, this is the epigraph is, uh, one is at once struck with the freedom from care that is everywhere evident in their faces. All is enjoyment and Saturday afternoons, all is merriment. They are kind to one another. An excited word is rarely heard, a blow is rarely struck. They are fond of animals and never cruel to them. And trigger warning, this is um, animal, there's some animal uh, abuse in this. Um, the boy slept on the floor with his dog that last night before they both left. A pool of her yellow vomit on the wood beside her shaking old body. He made up songs, sang to her about fields full of bones, the heat of silver suns. She dug her paw into his thigh as she smelled the smoke of the boy's father as he flicked ash down the stairs, coming closer. He was dumb drunk. He was sending his son away. The carriage had been called. It's suffering, son, it's suffering, father grunted, and the boy whimpered as he watched father drag her faded fur ear out into the yard. Spring dawn had broken with all its nauseous beauty, filling that bottle-filled field with sun, leaving the old dog blinking, dumb, the iron O of father's pistol barely felt as she searched for the eyes of the boy. He was inside, couldn't look, just heard scream of metal lodged. He ran into the day, clung to his father's coat, trying to crawl in him to hide, bring her back. Now boy belongs to New Yard, a sweeping spring of farmland where the other boys, the other patients, are gentle as they pet and poke the sides of sleeping sheep, run with wet-nosed mutts into the grass, point at the blade of geese across the clouds headed home. The boy is not among them, hidden beneath the barn, holding the squirming body of a rat plump off stolen crackers. He takes the rusted bite of a nail towards its trembling fur, which fuses stiff by blood. He stares as its yellow teeth chew air, its steel squeak. Beneath his grasp, it gasps as he leans his palm in, lets his weight weigh. 
The corpse is the color of the sand and dirt beneath the barn. The boy digs another small grave with his fingers. He smells the smoke from the other boys, lighting a fire, roasting red meat above the flame. How they whimper for scraps, leaping with their tongues drooling out of their mouths. When father dropped him off, he told the boy he'd bring him home tomorrow. His father gripped his shoulder like a pistol, then stumbled to the carriage, didn't turn back to see his son, son startled among the dumb dogs that follow the boys about in the fields. Okay. Dark. Dark. <laughs> Dark. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, do I have time? Should I read one more? Or yeah, okay. So I'm gonna read this this one. Y'all have heard this one before, but uh, this is called basketball, and it's about my older brother. I was the dunk master, fadeaway prophet, psycho murderer of the rim on that plastic mini hoop hung on the back porch side door beside the crushed FedEx boxes and the blue cooler full of spider webs. It was a world. The crowd would roar as I sealed another championship, Coach K shouting shoot as I fell backwards and flicked that apple-sized basketball up, the buzzer blaring mid-flight. And when I missed, no, I didn't. It was raining sideways. The night was out for sure. The moons illuminating the outline of clouds like sci-fi ships across starless space. I was running, the needles of my feet sharp on the sidewalk off into the big zero of the black and the fact you were missing anywhere, maybe hit by a truck, arrested, dead. I imagined you as you were earlier that day, monologuing verbless sentences as you spread and swirled Yu-Gi-Oh cards on the carpet, eyes rolling left and right, my hand rubbing your shoulder blade in small circles without sound. This changed you, your mind revolving around strange planets of madness. This lost you, your lumbering body, a target. I imagined you grabbing a stranger, holding them close with your hands, pleading for answers. Both of you terrified by each other, two mouths calling for help, the world full of the nothings of possibility. You were the real deal, releasing your three-pointer on that high hoop in our driveway with that flick, that announced authority, and I leaping towards your hands in pointless passion while the net splash and your gloating face filled my sight. It was nothing like my imagination. The way you slapped the ball out of my hands as I lunged for a layup, or the way you laughed at how my legs flew sideways when I shot. We played a 21, the score usually 21-none. You were the older brother, who could blame you? Not today, not today, you'd say, wagging your finger back and forth across my sweaty stare. Rematch, I'd squeal, yanking on the sleeve of your t-shirt as you walked inside. I heard dribbling far off and ran faster through that thin rain. There you were, at the neighborhood hoop, your shirt drenched, a basketball in your hands. You shot, the arc of your wrists burnt into your brain, the rain sliding off the ball like a bad dream. You could have been anyone. It was a world. Come home. It was a world as you spun that body upward and the beat up ball flew up and out and winning and winning and won. It was all over. It was all in our heads. The buzzer blaring and my arm around your soaked shoulder. The craze of victory in our eyes. We can play again tomorrow. It was a world. No more. It's time to go home. <laughs> Okay, that's all right. Um, thank you, guys. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was kind of kind of crazy with not hearing anything. I'm like, am I <laughs> alone? Like, well, um, <laughs> but thank you. All right, I'm going to introduce our next poet. Um, the great Sarah Green is a junior at Eastern Connecticut State University. She's enrolled in the secondary education program with the goal of becoming an English language arts teacher. She resides in Coventry, Connecticut with her partner as well as her dogs, cats, and hundreds of houseplants. Sarah's poems have appeared in Outrageous Fortune and Cardinal Arts Literary Journal. She's performed at Providence Poetry Slam and at College Union's Poetry Slam Invitational, Richmond 2015. Her poems range in themes of mental health, the mental health care system, loss and grief, privilege and racism, women's issues, identifying within the LGBTQIA plus community and the desperate need for human connection. In her spare time, Sarah tutors elementary and middle school age students and plays roller derby for Hartford area roller derby whalers. All right, Sarah. 
Thank you so much for the introduction, Oliver. Um, a tough act to follow. Um, it is very odd being on Zoom and having everything be quiet. Um, everyone can hear me? Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start um, by reading um, a blank verse poem, one that I generated for um, spoken word. Um, I actually have started with this poem for pretty much every reading. So um, <clears throat> we'll just start right off out of the gate. So um, this is called French Fry. My father is pulling into a Wendy's parking lot littered with shrivels of wind-filled bags and fists of napkins. The basement in my bones earthquakes when the car comes to a stop. My father has ordered himself a giant magazine of fries, each one a bullet cringed by its own weight. I watch him scoop the ketchup with the watery tendon and reach out to offer me the gift. A gift not even the hospital knew how to feed me. But my father is no hospital. My father has always been a heavy lifter, raises the shelf for installation, asks me to hand him the screw, fastens it to the wall, but can't grip the steering wheel long enough, can't shake the carpenter from his hands until they become Mickey Mouse, can't move towards me without the fry becoming a slingshot that recoils when fired. My father can't cross the bridge between us with the fry. My father's eyes loosen and welt as he tries to make out the last time he saw color in me, tries to remember how summers ago he would drive by the same Wendy's every day after picking me up from a coral camp and order us the biggest trumpet of fries, each one full with salt and acoustic and my belly full of arpeggios and glossy singer's pride. Now my stomach is the forever well. My father is calling my name down. You are so sick, he says, my father. No magic left to sell me, my father. No way to ask me to eat without giving me another opportunity to refuse the music. No way to watch me kill myself without pulling into a Wendy's to tempt hell itself out of my wind-filled body. He watches, anticipation emptied, as a father would never say the word anorexia without believing his daughter's ability to succumb to make-believe. Because to believe I do is to say I believe that this won't kill me. I can be magic, Dad. I can wind fill my childhood if I want to. I can come home from the hospital and drink the salts. I can hide in the basement and not come out for two days. I can still see you holding my dinner plate like a lunch tray in the museum of this beast. An eating disorder is a toolless project, and it is mine. And there is no room for your steady hand. My father, you're getting so old. Just let me do this. I could tell you this car is too full of a kind of love that I have yet to understand is only doing what it knows. Love is only doing what it knows. You are only doing what you know. But a daughter, a daughter, I don't. Thank you. So, um, yeah, <clears throat> my next poem um, is after um, Kaveh Akbar, um, and it's about a uh, plant called the pothos, also called devil's ivy, common house plant, very hard to kill. <laughs> um, okay. Pothos are wilting in their ceramic pots. Pothos are crisping away from and near the windows. Pothos are shedding by the banister and inside the vacuum filter. I clean a dish and pothos swell at the surface tension of the muck sink. The food scraps that won't go down are also pothos. The soap is likely also a pothos. Pothos are crunching out of the cereal box and scraping the kitchen floor. Pothos are dying out and around each other in long, gorgeous funeral processions or like party streamers snipped in the middle. 
pathos of forgetting they were in the corner for four years and now they are writhing with the dust bunnies and the dog toys. My father comes to move a dresser, a drawer opens and out comes a pothos. My dentist asks why it took so long for me to book an appointment. I open my mouth and he gasps at the pothos. Pothos are being watered and watered and watered and they are trailing on command hooks into the skylight and out onto the roof, but they are still dying and dying and dying and producing crude stems bare of leaves, like fishing hooks hanging in an old bastard shed. This Tuesday class is a pothos. This new hairstyle is a pothos. This poetry award is a pothos. I refuse to do anything that will bring me one small joy, a pothos searing and full adulterated sunshine oh lindsay you said you'd never leave me okay thank you everyone um okay so on the theme of uh ending relationships uh, my next poem um i wrote recently um it's a bit of a, like a frankenstein terza rima poem um it's kind of like two two and a half sonnets in one um i have a rhyme scheme happening and every line has 10 syllables because i like to make things hard <laughs> um okay so it's called desiato sand and gravel company east of the river the train tracks splinted into woodland we chased the stenching slats till moon tapped once on cream blue sky thumbprint Familiar sweat stains in our pits, masses of mosquitoes. It itched to be so warm for the first time. We found small path to sand bluffs, gravel piles, construction worn relic of desertion. Hunkered shoulders made of limestone swelled above horizon. You would not detour had you not seen glint of fever in my eyes. Convinced you at sunset's nickel red timing to climb inch by gallivanting inch, feet collapsed back and sunken down into heaviness. Coarser are my hands, scaling sand like crushed flask. You, ten feet above, the first clear morning of your farness to me. Can't think you cold yet, tongue twitched with terse sand, please adore me. We arrived to the top of the peak, listened, flint glistened in your big tooth. Then you asked, you asked why we didn't fall through, get buried, sink inside. I still don't know, but there, there, smack dab in the center of open space, for a second, wind cutting stillness, untasked by four walls a home will make, windowless bereft of gravity, of breath, of traps, your nose leaked, millions of sands, starchy grits below shifted when we did, or perhaps they didn't. Sand mimicked how we will turn over in bed to wake to another, to the other, act annoyed or betrayed or vice versa. Bliss went with that sunset. Catch it now, you asshole, before I learn to dodge, turn, resist your outstretched hand day buried beneath crass rust and tractor pile up straddling dust troughs have you ever made sense of our contrast up there before we left this bluff before we dated for so many years and poured ourselves inward and away from our love have you ever made sense of why you flinched when i touched you on that bluff and you laughed because it hurt to lean into it, to kiss. Backtracked to home, filled with gravity, vast distances of betweenness, ran bath, squirmed there beside me as sand knifed our soft backs. Thank you, guys. Um, how am I doing for time? I have time for one more. All right, so my next poem that I'm going to do is also a poem that I um, generated for spoken word. Um, and it explores um, a bit of like what I think is part of the human condition. Um, when we lose someone we love, um, there is, especially if that person is cremated, there is um, 
like a um a sense of ownership that comes with having that person um you know right there on our shelf um and i think that um what when my so my sister um committed suicide um a few years ago and um there's obviously a lot of ways that i can honor her um and in poetry um but this poem explores um my own sort of um messed up feelings um, or what have you um, in relationship to it. So um, the poem is called Messed Up and it's talking to myself. When I am hosting my half sister's wake, my own honesty steps out of my body. What are you doing here? What are loose hugs doing for strangers that are not her strangers? Why do you stuff me into condolences you are not right to give the way you give? Like the grief was all yours and now you break bread. You met her when you were 16. Four years of inventing sisterhood is just not enough time. Look at the litany of ways you retell the same story. Look at the little box on the table with pictures of her with dogs and bar friends and ex-girlfriends and not with you heartbreak curator. Look at the way your halfness to her has only been half till now. Look at her eyes. Look at your eyes, frantic to find one more sameness. You beg your own hair to be more like her hair, to be her hair, to be close enough to redeem yourself for being here. But now all you have is this little box of her. You could be that too if you wanted to. You could live on the mantle. You could wear someone's Red Sox hat. You could hold the garland at Christmas time. You could be one of many things that are just so carelessly there. You could be useful even like that. When your half-sister took her life, you didn't know enough to write the poem. You wrote about sand because that's what she wanted to be, and she is now what a rock is made of. And this can be okay because she always liked rocks. She kept them in her jan sport, her fanny pack, her window sill. Now she is a rock and you collect her, millions of her, doorstop, property maker, paperweight, trip causer. If you look at a rock long enough, you start wanting it all to yourself. You want her all to yourself. So you don't have to look at the way your grief is just five stages of denial. All the months after she is gone, you won't think about the note she did not write for you or the way you wanted a sister that you never let her be. Call me the shaker of your truth and I will shake you like a baby. I will not let you sleep. I will undo who you think you are, bootleg sister, false promise maker. Do you understand? Sign the funeral home guest book like a yearbook. Tip the limousine man. Make sure to hold a child at the grave. Do you even love her? enough to pick up the phone unstitch the noose with a single concern can you even understand cassandra needed you she called you little me once thanks everyone um so oh let me just was... interrupt if i may yeah. you'll introduce the next poet i mm -hmm. we've had a number of people um hopping on i know because of technical difficulties, we had kind of a late start and um, people are only now getting the email with the revised link. So I promise everyone who's registered for this uh, reading will receive a link to the recording we're making. So you'll be able to see what, what you've missed. So, um, and thank you for joining the, the folks who were able to come and wonderful reading so far. Please, um, Sarah, I, would you introduce the next poet? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm honored to present the next poet, Elisa Mejia. Elisa Mejia is a senior at Quinnipiac University where she majors in psychology. She was awarded the Donald Hall Poetry Prize at Quinnipiac and her poems have been published in Quinnipiac's magazine, Montage. Elisa is a student athlete at Quinnipiac playing for the women's volleyball team. Besides poetry and sports, her hobbies include playing piano and singing. After graduation, Elisa plans to take a year off before pursuing her MBA overseas as an international student. 
Elisa was born in the Bronx and currently resides in Port Chester, New York. Thanks, guys. Elisa. Thanks, Sarah, for the nice introduction and for your beautiful words, as always, I'm breathtaking. Um, thank you all for having me and for being here today. Um, I'm Elisa. Um, I was born and raised in the Bronx, which is where a lot of the inspiration for my work um, derives from. I actually had not started writing poetry until very recently because in the Bronx, we don't really have access to a lot of that type of stuff. So I just recently found my place in the poetry world and I'm so grateful that I have. Um, my first poem, I remember the day after, was written after a very um, life altering period in my life that was very recent. Um, and I have a tendency to deal with things through humor. Um, so that's kind of where the poem is. And it's written in a one long sentence to kind of encompass both all the chaos and the thoughts I was having, um, while also the thoughts, um, the, the thoughts and feelings I was having at the time. So here's, I remember the day after. The house was silent besides the irritating sound of my rubber shoes dragging on the hardwood floor after a long day of going through the motions. And I couldn't even make it to the kitchen before being reminded, thanks to the emptiness of the living room, that you didn't live there anymore. Allowing that whole idea of being fatherless to turn me off to the thought of food completely. So I threw on my oh, so I threw my phone on the couch and put on a pair of fuzzy socks so I could glide across the wood floor instead of walk because my body felt too weak to carry itself all the way from my room to my room, which felt miles away from where I was right then. But luckily, just as I'd been entertaining the idea of crashing on the floor and sleeping by the fridge that night, my brain remind, reminded me that I'd forgotten to finish my podcast of Matthew McConaughey telling me how to be happy, which led me to finally slide to my room to resume where I had left off somewhere around him saying something like, you can't be happy if you're doing it for other people or some bullshit along the lines of that. But nonetheless, it drowned out the sound of the nocturnal animals prowling around inside my subconscious mind. And at least my thoughts could alternate between Matthew telling me how happiness comes from within and my within telling me that I was a piece of shit. But hey, at least there was some balance in my nighttime routine. And I thought if I was lucky, there would be a moment of silence during the internal battle long enough for me to close my eyes and go to sleep before the, before the sun started to peek through the little bit of curtain I'd left open to gauge such events. And that if I was lucky enough, I'd be so sleep deprived that Matthew McConaughey's words would have felt like a lullaby that put me into a deep sleep so that his words could sink into my subliminal thoughts and I would magically wake up happy. If I was lucky, I'd wake up the next day and the only pit in my stomach would be because I skipped yet another meal that night, not because I simply just couldn't stop thinking of you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, so there was a period of time in my life when I was younger in the Bronx where I was alternating between public school and then I was put in Catholic school. So it was really hard for me to go from you know, playing kickball to then just sitting in mass during recess. And despite being in mass as much as I was as a kid, I still felt really far from God. Um, and I felt like that with everything going on with my father, it kind of paralleled each other with my longing for both of them. So my next piece is, I don't know where he went, but sometimes I still pray he finds me. I don't remember if it was a specific day that I lost him. I don't remember which Sunday when wine was no longer his blood and bread no longer his body. For which Sunday I no longer regarded my sins and no longer repented them either. Maybe it was the day I understood why people don't wait until marriage. Or maybe the day Mr. Ehrlich died and out of anger I screamed his name in vain. Or maybe the day my dad left and I lost faith in the idea of fathers. My faith is a forbidden fruit, but sometimes I still pray that its temptations lead me back to him. Thank you all. Um, so my next poem is kind of coincides with this last one in my struggle with faith, um, and yet my still constant questions to like a higher power for things that I don't understand. Um, and I do love to write about nature. So you'll kind of see that in my next few pieces as well. So this is Mother Nature. I have a question. Mother Nature, how did you wake up this morning? I felt your exhaustion when the wind exhaled on my face as I walked out the door. Maybe you had no choice with the two crows arguing relentlessly at six in the morning, 
their screams echoing through your mouth things. Genuinely, how did you do it? I saw your willows weeping when I walked to the door to the car and the remnants of their tears left condensation on my window. Mother Nature, how do you wake up trusting that if you cry, every other ounce of your being will continue living unperturbed by the rain? How do you wake up each morning knowing that the day will undoubtedly end in darkness? Mother Nature, tell me please, how can I wake up? Thank you all. Oliver, this is very strange. <laughs> Um, so this next piece, Beneath the Frosted Tree, kind of continues my nature theme. Um, and it was written for my neighbor in the Bronx, who was a foster kid. His name is Adam. When I was young, I was too, I didn't understand the stories that he was telling me and all these things. I didn't conceptualize that they were actually happening to him because we were just kids. Um, and I often find myself thinking about him. Um, so I wrote him a poem and it's written in blank verse and it's called Beneath the Frosting Tree, which was inspired by my perception of something being affected by its external forces and not being able to do anything about it. Beneath the Frosting Tree, for Adam, the foster kid who lived next door, thank you for sharing your story with me. Beneath the frosting tree, fallen leaves laid like playing cards dropped from the hands of a child and the willows wept as winter came to attack and destroy the beloved world around it. He too feared the harsh war of winter. His short-term mom withheld the world from him and far too frequently used the base rate check to invest in clothes and shoes, no toys, no food. Frozen fruit fell to the tree trunks below, forcing the grass once drunk from the sugars of the pears above to resign to the cold. The white flag of surrender veiled the ground. He too despised the time the ground froze over. His short-term dad concealed the world from him, burnt him with cigars to keep him warm and left fumes of weed to consume him. In spring, when the trees defrost and the sun announces its return, the earth rejoices. The cold that once controlled the beautiful land is gone like the snow on the ground below. I wish I could say that he too embraced the sun's return, but that would be a lie. And if I could, I would rewrite his story. But for some trees, there will always be winter. Thank you all so very much. This is my final piece. Um, it's a monosyllabic piece um, inspired by Tupac's ode, um, Rose That Grew From Concrete, which was the first poetry book I had ever um, laid my hands on. So here's Ode to the Lone Rose. Long live the rose that grew from concrete, Tupac. Here is an ode to the lone rose that grew from the crack outside my home in the Bronx. The rose that bloomed and grew with time. The rose that stood tall as a mark of grace and might on a street that only saw hard times. A rose that splashed the block with a hue of red that broke up the gray that merged one gray house to the next and those homes to the gray stones in the ground. Here is an ode to the lone rose that helped a young girl keep in mind. There is more to the world to see past the only street she had known for years. But there is more to fear than the sound of cops up and down the street. More to smell than leave the next door. More to feel than pain and fear. An ode to the rose that stands as proof that light can be seen in spite of love. Here an ode to the lone rose. Here an ode to how I rose. Thank you all very much. My heart is filled with gratitude, and I have the honor of introducing my great friend, John. John Wing is a junior at Yale University, where he majors in English. He has received the Meeker Award in the Yale English Department for Best Essay, the National Young Arts Award for Creative Nonfiction, and the Wallace Prize for Fiction. Born and raised in Minnesota, John hopes to be a professor of creative writing in the future, or a journalist who secretly writes poetry a writing mentor of some sort. He entered college thinking he would be on the pre-med track, but quickly realized his devotion to language, understanding not just its powers, but also its limitations in the form of weaponization. He enjoys watching anime, reading novels, and poetry collections, and singing with his friends. Here's John Wood. Thank you so much, Elisa. Um, can y'all hear me well? Also, I just want to give a shout out to some people on the Zoom. Um, first off is my mom and dad. 
um, calling from Minnesota, <laughs> um, where hopefully it's spring right now um, and not snowing. Um, and also my older sister who's calling in from Boston and just finished a work day with her high schoolers. She's a math teacher. Um, and my professor, uh, Professor Stillman. <laughs> Um, so I'll read four poems today, um, and I think all of them can be characterized by um, a quote from the poet Jericho Brown, every poem is a gesture toward home. And the first poem I'll read is very much in conversation with Elisa's final poem, The Rose That Grew From The Concrete, um, and it's kind of very interested in this kind of savior narrative or like the racks to riches narrative um, that we commonly hear. And it's trying to critique um, the very common idea of making it. Cinderella's Liberator. Transporting the girl I long observed in the sisterhood's crystal ball, my carriage passes through an apple orchard and then a wood where swallows have built a nest. Below them, a floor strewn with twigs and pine cones. Soon, she makes it to the castle gates. The coachman halts, the footman opens the carriage, and the ivory horses neigh in parting. Surrounded by a river and willows, the castle interrupts the light of stars with its own, from bedrooms, private libraries, dining rooms, balconies, down the velvet staircase and into the ballroom she goes, light-fingered, holding up her gown. Everyone watches, even the violinists, dropping their bows to see a girl who just finished scrubbing chimney soot. The prince leads her back, past the drapes, and they dance beneath a giant vase of hyacinths, a cold glove pressing her lower back, the part that is naked. Outside, the horses in their golden bridles wait, but make haste, Cinderella, return to the least receptive of origins. The carriage wheels are beginning to creak. And the second poem comes from a writing prompt given by my professor, Louise Glick, and my classmates and I were asked to write a poem um, that begins with if or when and that ends forever. Um, and the task was to narrate like a non-literary object. So I thought about this one um, Vietnamese movie that I remember watching in probably elementary school. And it's a tale of these three um, orphans, um, their siblings and kind of um, goes through their whole life from childhood to adulthood. Triptych. When the youngest two, a brother and sister, are taken in by a rich household, the eldest, too old, stays at the orphanage. One evening, the director pats his shoulder, then leaving on his nightstand a bowl of soup and a tray of cheese, ham, and crackers. He doesn't cry. The last sunlight makes the silver platter flare. Two, he escapes for the woods and sleeps until dawn when birds lift off the branches and scatter in twos like the married and threes like the Holy Trinity. Weaving through pines, he is headed to the town. He wedges himself between an antique shop and an abandoned warehouse. The fog thickens, erasing the trees first and then every pole, cell towers, street names, and bus stop signs, traffic lights. Three, the sun sets and rises, a decade passes, the door chimes of the antique shop ring, staring through a window, he sees people buying sofas. He's squatting on a pine stump, half encased in ice, as woodcutters, sweating buckets near the district fountain, play musical chairs. Thank you. Um, and this next poem I'll read is probably my favorite one. Um, it's narrating my childhood memories of 
watching my mom in our Minnesota home um, and her cooking up egg rolls to um, make that extra buck um, and selling to various people in our community. Um, and it begins with a epigraph from Robert Frost. What gold more innocent could one have asked for? The chariot. She was, grabbing, she was wrapping one egg roll after another. The boy witnessed it evolve, the omen. Hands on glass noodles, ground pork, carrots, cabbage. Over decades, above the stove, grease flew up, marrying dust and dirt, roots blooming on the ceiling. She let each wrap sink in the pot, golden horses fallen into a canyon. After the fall, the most hideous glistening. By their microwave, stick on labels, a blue inked pen, a pillar of to-go boxes around which the Romans had gathered, but to which they tried never to return. The egg rolls went in neatly, two dollars for each piece of the charioteer mother, her son behind and below, not unlike a general. And this final poem is very much preoccupied with um, kind of idea of labor and it's trying to reimagine a space in which um, leisure and communal leisure can be um, more present and more common. Devotional in a snow globe. From this bridge where people rarely stop, you gaze down at the water and I take a seat on the rail. Radios distribute music. At the bank, grass is rusting. All around, spectators. Construction workers bend to remove bricks from a sidewalk and pack the ground beneath. You take off the coat I bought and tie it around your waist. The sun grants us amnesty. Facing the clouds, while a waterfall of birds shatters in the river, you avoid condescending to those dusk-colored vests whose wearers can now stop kneeling and unwind. The pavement is level until next time. Then I get up and look out, look past, over the ferry boats, the bike paths, the picnic tables and benches, and toward the alternatives. Thank you. And then um, I'll introduce our final poet, Isabella. Um, Isabella is a senior at Western Connecticut State University where she majors in professional writing. Her poetry has been included in Western's Breathing Space Broadside series with publication in the university's literary magazine, The Echo, and display throughout campus as a poster. In addition, she was selected to represent Western at a, at a poetry reading at Bird's Books in Bethel, Connecticut. Although writing is her main artistic focus, Isabella enjoys creating art in other forms, including photography, video, drawing, and painting. A resident of Westport, Connecticut, Isabella also loves to learn about people and different cultures. She spent the spring semester of her junior year studying abroad in the Czech Republic, additionally traveling to nine other countries. And for five years, she has participated in Christian missionary work in the Dominican Republic and Haiti. After graduation in May, she will be traveling to Vietnam to teach English to children. Isabella. Thank you so much, John, and thank you guys so much, um, Barb, at, for organizing this. And um, it's really an honor to be here. And um, I hope you enjoy the poetry. And uh, it's been an honor just being behind all of these poets. And um, everybody did an amazing job today, as always. And uh, Thank you guys. <laughs> All right, so um, the first poem that I'm gonna read, or at least the theme of most of my poetry is going to be based on um, the based on different narratives. Um, so the first poem that I'm gonna read is called Moving Day. And um, it's just a, a narrative poem. It has a, a story within it. Um, and yeah, so Moving Day. 
Open these windows to let the sun sleep with us on bronze-stained floorboards hard as bone and teeth while we think of what's not and make children in our minds with bruised bones from the flight they climb like planes while crashing limbs thinking of here and today as we debone meats and bake breads for dinner to fill the void foundation left while laughing, dancing, choking on bones we misplaced in sweet milk meant to wash our scratchy throats, crying and painting the walls with bone marrow in our breath, asking it to stop, yet we carry on, gnaw box tape and unpack, while I, your borrowed bone, Reflect on our name, and if home is a word, not a place for eye, with not a place with souls for eyes of flesh and bone. Okay. And um, so this next poem, um, I, I made in a poetry workshop, and it's just kind of deals with um, poetry on the page. Unfortunately, you guys can't see the page, but I hope you can hear the page through the poem. <laughs> Um, so it's called, this poem is called The Guilt of Mindfulness. It's 2 p.m. and your eyes move under your closed lid and I poke your cheek, your dreaming elsewhere and I am alone. The sun is brightest at this hour and I forget it's winter. I close my eyes, remember lying on wet grass to cool off cloaked in sheer warmth like the sting of a slap or the thrill of fear I want to feel. The fleeting chase, yet the facing of need is pleasure, and yet I idle between unconsciousness and hope. Maybe I'll leave this bed before dark, and maybe I'll get up, or maybe I'll stay still, fill my piece half full with cream, pretend that it is water. Um, so <laughs> this next poem is um, a cadre lore. So the poem takes place in five different parts. Each part can be a poem within itself, um, but they're just kind of separated by these parts. And the poem collectively is um, supposed to be a love poem because that's the theme of the cadre lore. Um, but this poem happens to be an, an extension of my previous poem, The Guilt of Mindfulness. It's called The Divine Serpent's Tongue. One, words clog my ears like parasites. I pull them out one by one, yet thousands make their nest. They move deeper, fill my mouth as sweet as tangerines and warm as butter. Eating what's left of my I am, they leave no room for doubt. From wandering limbs to docile mind, for once I'm not alone. Two, Going 80 in a 25, the cigarette-scented little tree dances. As our wagon wobbles over absent ground, I push the windshield with my toes in hopes it crack. I pray we crash over the river's bearings. Maybe we'd float and they'd bury our bodies together. But what if I went without you? Would you pull me out? Would you live on? I look at you with empty eyes. Sometimes I wish you'd go then and only then I'd leave you. Three, sky bulb, light bulb sun, whisper weighted vows and vacant pews, make them trite, they're watching us from baths below the ground. Guide me through empty clouds, take my hand with copper palms, breathe life upon my pale cheeks, open my eyes just enough to burn like silver, make me new, make me whole. Four, sit with me and listen over burnt coffee cups and strawberry pancakes, under dim yellow light, let my eyes gaze at yours and your lips, through broken glass, let me speak and listen. For when you rest your head below my chin, holding the weight of your grief, I will listen. Five, when will we reach the sp speed of light? Will birds still swim through clouds and mice in murky streams? or will the waterfall cover our feet, rise, drown your voice, let the river's mouth kiss your nose and fill it, wash the dirt beneath my nails, swallow my grief, and carry me above the sea, engulfed by raging redemption. 
And um, this last poem is called The Stoplight Off the Highway. Um, and it's just a, a prose poem in three parts. Um, and it's, I guess, just a long continuation of thoughts. <laughs> um, so yeah, The Stoplight Off the Highway. Carry me to daylight as I reach to place your name and for recognition in your voice that singing to me a lullaby retreats like the hymn of the cicadas we further bury beneath us because I know no one known to know me better than that of a stranger and the thrill of trusting your weak grasp on my sanity keeps my worry from bubbling over. Lay me on frozen blades and that scratch my sides as I restlessly fight the idea of you in my dream and scream soundless sighs because the weight of you digs six feet above where you found me and pitied my lack of hope with an offer of redemption. Leave me before you meet my eyes and see that I've been crying since you picked me like the lavender in the garden you left to dry because I'm afraid the road will end with a bright red light and we will go deeper into the night and I will come to know you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, wow. You guys, this is your readings, your, your content and your delivery is so mature. I just, I, I've been just bowled over by your poems. I'd like to ask each of you a question, if that's okay. And I, I'm going to start with you, Bella, if that's all right. Um, well, first I wanted to just make a quick comment that the, the moving day poem with all the bone imagery was just spellbinding. I wanted to ask, I know in your introduction, they mentioned that you've done a lot of traveling. Um, how, how has all the work you've done uh, working with children and, and also in traveling affected your work? Um, I think that a lot of my poetry, well, at least the ones that I read today haven't been after my traveling, but now a lot of it is influenced by um, a lot of different experiences that I've had and people I've met and just watching people and writing it down and turning it into a poem. So, yeah. Thank you, beautiful, beautiful poem. That I Thank wrote you. Down, I wrote down one of your lines, uh, when we reach, when will we reach the speed of light? Just very, very wonderful line. Um, Oliver, I, oh gosh, your brother, your basketball brother poem was beautiful. Can you, Talk a little bit about how family and friends have influenced your work. Yeah, I mean, I think like this project that I'm working on right now, which is a is pretty much all about family, both family like immediate, like living family, and also like ancestors. Like, um, so I think that I and I like kind of interested in how the past plays so much into the present, and how so much of like. And I haven't even yet done this in my work, but I really want to do even more is like, how does my older brother's illness and the way we treated him, how is that like directly in conversation with how the kids were treated at this center that my great great grandfather ran? And I think in a way, hopefully just them being side by side, you will make those connections. But I think there's also more to be done. And I think that that's, um, yeah, and I think that I'm like really what I'm after is like, I don't know. I'm just a, I just like love the like emotional bite. So I just like want those like, and I feel like you get those the most from people that you love and care about, and like who have you spent more time with than your your family who you love and care about. So it's kind of like that's kind of where I've first kind of taken the. It's, it's kind of been the center of like all my all my poetry. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, do you foresee if you do a collection of those poems? Um, having them side by side, the ones about your ancestors and- your, your Yeah, work. well, so actually my my thesis, this is this was work all for my senior thesis, which is actually due in uh, seven days, a week exactly. So uh, guys, when we do our reading at Western, just know I'll have turned my thesis in five hours earlier. Um, but the, um, so I'm, I'm putting it up, trying to figure out the order right now. So it includes both photos. The, the book includes photos both of like the current of my family and my brother, and then also photos um, from the Fernald Center, um, like archival photos and footage taken of the center now. And so, and it's poems that, about my brother. And so it's like, it's all kind of interwoven. I don't want it to be, it's not like separate into two different sections. Yeah, I really want it to be like, 
these things are really linked to the past and the present of mental health, brain illness, and how we think and treat these kids. Yeah. Wonderful. That's, that's sounds a wonderful hybrid. I, I love the way a lot of collections now are including um, different voices and, and, and images as well. So that's, I, I want to see it when you're done. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, Sarah, um, your poem about anorexia is very brave. Talk, if you would, about why it's important um, to discuss issues like that publicly and openly. Um, that's a good question. Um, thank you. I, um, I think that um, different um, mental health narratives are typically um, glorified or um, slandered in social media. Um, and I think that, you know, personal narratives of dealing with mental health issues um, is, is essentially just voicing a, a silenced uh, narrative. And, and um, I think that that's really important to, um, to like, take up space in that regard um, in different spaces um, so that more people can be informed about um, mental health issues. Oh, so true. Um, really a, a beautiful and brave poem. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Uh, the first poem you read. Um, Alyssa, um, I know you made some references to the, the monosyllabic poem, uh, which was inspired by Tupac. Um, who are some of the other poets who have influenced your work and how, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing some of that? For sure. Um, as I kind of mentioned, I just recently got into poetry. Um, so I have really just been reading a whole bunch of poets just all at once, but I've really recently been into Ada Limon, um, which I really love the work. Um, it's just I like that she talks about nature and all that stuff is really beautiful to me. I'm also going through the classics. So I'm reading Robert Frost and all these things that you're like, obviously you have to read it. We didn't really have any poetry books in the Bronx and I intend on bringing some more down there. Um, but yeah, I honestly, it's a great question because I just have so many right now that I've just recently just been reading and I'm like, how did I just get my hands on this now? And even listening to, you know, my friends, these wonderful poets, I learned so much from everyone, my professors. I just feel like I'm just learning so much and I'm really just grateful for that. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I loved, there was a line I wrote down, the nocturnal animals crawling around my unconscious mind. <laughs> so I'm familiar with that feeling, as we all are, I'm sure. Um, and then John, wow. I, the, Poem about your mother making egg rolls was just, just really not just beautiful um, as a tribute, but also just as a as a poem, not just as a poem, but as a, a very mature and solid poem. Um, talk about writing about heritage and and family for you. Uh, is that something I know? You, you, I love the Glick poem, inspired poem too. But uh, is do you find yourself writing a, a about family and their influence on you? Yeah, I think this is a question like a lot of poets have to kind of grapple with, like how much autobiography should you put in or is one allowed to put in? Um, and I think like with experience, um, one comes to one's own terms um, with what feels right. Um, so I always begin my poems in real life and like there's no obligation, it's not nonfiction to like be completely true and accurate. Um, so I think that's kind of what makes poetry magical. You begin in the real world and you kind of pick pieces and make associations that usually, or like put objects together that might not be placed together usually. Um, and from there something, um, I think very spellbind spellbinding happens. Well, it was, a poem free from sentiment, which is also what can happen sometimes. You can become a victim of sentimentality if you're writing poems about family or, or even autobiographical poems. But that was, it was uh, not a touch of sentimentality in there. Um, and I hope it's not snowing in Milwaukee <laughs> or, in, um, or Minnesota, rather. Um, 
now also I know part of your your role as as um, Connecticut Poetry Circuit poets is you you tour. Um, how many places have you read so far, and what is coming up on your docket? Anyone can take that. Oh, <laughs> have you read? Have you read in um, places yet? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, we've we've read in. Um, we so far we've read in what three or four four places, and we have two more. Oh. So we've read at Wesleyan, Yale, Eastern Connecticut, and Quinnebog community and now we're here and then we are reading next week at Quinnipiac and Western. Yeah. Oh that's that's great. I think that's that's a really wonderful thing. And I'm glad we're recording this because I, I think a lot of students who either weren't aware of tonight's reading or aren't even aware of the Connecticut Poetry Circuit um, will find it really beneficial to see uh, what you guys are up to. And, and it, my apologies, not only to the poets, but to our audience for the technical problems we had. Um, uh, we, we have not had things like that happen before. So it's, it's sad that it was tonight because I think we might've lost some viewers, but what we'll do is we'll send the link to the, the, this recording to everyone who registered so they'll get to hear your poems. Um, so, um, but meanwhile, I wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank um, Professor Gentile and the other poets who served in the panel to, to select you, you five. Um, your work is wonderful. Keep it up and best of luck with, with your futures. So yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Round of applause. Yeah. Round, really round. Yes. Thank you. Um, I you know I can open it up. If anybody in the audience has a question, you can just click on your your um, if you don't mind being recorded visually and audially. Um, you can click your un unmute yourself and ask the question if you have one. Yeah, that phenomenal reading. The future of poetry is so yes. bright. Thank you, Jordan yes. Franklin. That's such a right. true statement. All right. Well, good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ridgefield Library, for um, being our platform and yeah. hosting us. And um, uh, best of luck. Happy spring. Happy National Mo po Poetry Month. I can't forget that. Yes, Ooh. that is what is. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Barb. Okay. Thank you, Barb. Thank you, yeah. Barb. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming, thank everyone. It's been a treat. Oh, it really has. Thank you. Good night, all.